MPMI, which is the new virtual seminar series uh, that MPMI, the journal, is hosting. We've been having, this is our third, we are having them every other week, and it's been a terrific way to connect to, with the community, to um, colleagues uh, from all over the world, and has been a lot of fun for us as organizers. Um, and I want to introduce my co-host today, Lee Jun Ma, who is also a senior editor at MPMI, focusing on uh, genome sequencing and assembly questions, and she brings a lot of expertise to that. Really delighted to have her on the editorial board. Um, and she'll be co-hosting, so we'll be answering the questions together. So um, brief comment on how we're gonna do this. Uh, so after I get everything started, uh, at the end, we'll, have, we'll be taking questions from the Q&A. And if you look at the bottom of your board, you'll see Q&A down there. And it would be great if you type questions into there. You can type them in at any time. We just will start answering them at the end. Um, and look forward to hearing from everybody. We will stay and answer all your questions. This is a terrific way, I think, for people to interact with the authors. So um, one of the goals of this series is to help people engage and connect with MPMI, uh, the journal, with our articles, with our content, with our authors, uh, for colleagues across the world, and also to increase inclusion. And so we're trying to foster more of a culture of inclusion here by um, this is freely available. There's no, you can access all of these talks. Uh, there's no subscription requirement. You do not have to be a member. Um, that's true both for this talk right now live, and I'm delighted to see that we have so many people joining us live. We have uh, over 100 already, um, and, but also the recording. So I know this is an excellent time for some people. We have chosen this time to be helpful for, uh, to be a good time for, of course, the Americas, where I am, um, but also um, Europe, Africa, and uh, the Middle East, this is still a good time. I know, although I know that there are people signing in from all around the world and that's, uh, you know, I really value your participation. Uh, every other week we'll be switching time zones. So our next talk will be at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the East Coast, which will be 9 a.m. in Beijing. And um, I've been writing a little, a little Excel spreadsheet so I can keep track of this. So this will also be convenient for people in Australia and New Zealand. Will be semi-convenient for people in India. Um, will not be so good for people in Europe that time. And so that's why we're recording because we really want to have everybody be able to join us. And we know that since we are a global community, this is the International Society of MPMI um, that hosts the journal, that, that we need to be able to um, adjust our time so that we can connect as well as possible. Also, because these are all recorded, you can go back over them at any time. And I think this is particularly helpful for um, listeners in our international community for whom English is not a first language. You can listen, you can go back and review parts that were a little hard to understand. Um, and also you can ask questions of the authors themselves, something you can't do when you're just reading a paper. And so um, today, uh, oh, and before I say that, so this is of course a fully accessible um, seminar series, and I just wanted to announce that, that MPMI will be going fully open access as of January 2021. Very mm -hmm. excited to make that announcement here when we have our international community present. Um, really excited that we're gonna be doing that, fully gold open access. Everybody will be able to access these papers but I do want to highlight that the current, um, the currently all of the papers that are being discussed on this series, we are reopening them to open access so that they can be accessible. But of course, today's talk is a technical advance and all of those are already open access. And so um, we encourage you after the seminar, if you have more questions, to go back to read the paper, to dive a little more deeply, um, think about how you might be able to use this technical advance in your own research. And of course, you can always follow up by contacting uh, John McDowell and David Hake, who are the corresponding authors, and you can find their emails on the paper. So, okay, so after that exciting announcement, and I should say that John McDowell was our last editor-in-chief of MPMI. Oh, 
I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Jean Harris. I'm the editor-in-chief of MPMI, and I'm hosting this series. Sorry about that. Um, and um, the previous editor-in-chief was John McDowell, who's, who's one of our speakers today. And he really helped lay a lot of the groundwork for what we've been continuing to um, make the open up MPMI to be fully open access. So um, really excited to have him here. And so today's speakers are John McDowell and David Hake. And they're gonna talk about the power of a collaboration. Uh, they are coming, bringing different tools, expertise, and questions together to be able to really open up some new insights into the evolution of an important pathogen. And so I'm going to turn that over to them with one brief comment that our next talk will be by Hong Lu. Uh, and she's gonna be talking about a very interesting uh, virus aphid plant interaction in which the virus actually gives the aphid uh, a benefit when competing with other insects on the plant. So that's a really strange and interesting story. So that's going to be two weeks from now. Um, okay, reminder before we start, please type your questions into the Q&A box. You'll see it at the bottom. And Li Jun and I will read uh, these questions um, and, and you'll get your answers at the end. Okay, so I'm now going to turn it over to John McDowell and David Hake. Welcome, thank you very much. And of course, for people who want the speaker view, um, you can click at the top, uh, there's a little box called show active speaker video and that makes the rest of us go away. So, welcome. Great, thank you so much, Jean. And thank you for the invitation and thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, this is something uh, John and I are both pretty excited about. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen here. All right. So, uh, yeah, today we're going to talk about nanopore sequencing of um, Phytophthora catsisi and, and how doing that revealed some hidden complexity. And again, I'm David Hake, um, and John McDowell is also going to talk a bit about uh, this work. And you can see our contact information um, here on the screen if you want to get in touch if you have more questions after today. So um, is any, anywhere we should start with some acknowledgments. Um, and when I say we throughout this talk, I really mean these two guys, uh, Chin Ming Chui from my lab and John Hurley from John McDowell's lab. Um, I put PhD here because they both uh, subsequently have graduated. Um, and, and are moving on to bigger and better things, which is fantastic. So <clears throat> starting out, we had three simple goals for this project. The first was um, what I wanted to do, I'm, I'm, by training I'm a plant and microbial genomicist, and what I really wanted to do is be able to resolve complex genomes in real time, right? To go to the field where pathogens were um, on a plant and actually sequence them, figure out who's there, and see if we can reconstruct genomes. The uh, a secondary goal is to see if we could use long read data to improve the um, CAPCC genome uh, in its current state. And then finally, um, you know, being able to just acquire the sequencing data is not enough, right? Even if we could acquire the sequencing data within two days, Typical assembly approaches take 30 to 40 days of compute time um, with these long, noisy reads. And so we wanted to see if we could um, establish a, a more efficient computational pipeline for working with, with this high error rate data. Um, and for an introduction to the organism, I'm gonna turn it over to John McDowell, who knows that much better than I do. Thank you, David. So uh, as David mentioned, he um, entered this project looking for a um, complex microbial genome to serve as a, um, as a test case. And fortuitously, we're one floor above David's lab. So he, um, he came around to our place and we said, boy, we've, we have a good genome for you. <laughs> it belongs to this organism that's called Phytophthora capsizi. So most of you, I think, have probably heard of the Phytophthora genus. It, um, it contains um, a number of omycete species, many of which cause uh, destructive diseases on crops. And in the case of Phytophthora capsizi, it's uh, the, the worst disease problems it causes are on uh, solanaceous species like peppers and tomatoes, um, cucurbits, and also legumes. 
the um, species collectively has a very broad host range and does a lot of damage on a worldwide basis um, every year. Now, the reason that we're particularly interested in this species is because there are certain strains of Phytophthora capsizi that grow very well on Arabidopsis. This comes from work that was pioneered in um, Francine Gover's group a few years ago. They did a very nice job of establishing an Arabidopsis Phytophthora capsizi pathosystem that was very easy for us in the McDowell lab to adopt and we're particularly excited about it because it's a, um, it provides a um, very nice system for looking at root responses to oomycetes and Arabidopsis. And this was something that we previously lacked. The, um, and you can see in the, um, in the pictures on the, the right-hand side of the slide, the, um, the life cycle of the pathogen. It's spores attach to the epidermis of the roots, and then it penetrates to the inner layers and makes filamentous hyphae that grow in the cortex. Now, along the way, this pathogen secretes effectors into host cells to, um, to make the cells do its bidding. And the pathogen also acquires nutrients from the hosts that are um, through means that are currently essentially unknown. And so that in particular is an aspect that we'd like to explore. Now, as um, David will mention later, a, um, a very nice reference genome already exists for PCAP-CZ, but like most eukaryotic genomes, room for improvement exists. So we saw this as a great opportunity to set up a collaboration that would benefit not only my group and David's group, but everyone else in the world who's interested in Phytophthora capsizi or comparative genomics of Phytophthora species. So with that, I will um, turn it back over to David. Great. So as was just mentioned by, uh, by John McDowell, the, <clears throat> the Lamore lab produced a reference genome, um, which uh, was a very high quality genome, um, especially for the time period, the 2012, when it was produced, right? So this uh, assembly assembled a total sequence length of around 56 megabase pairs, um, just over 10,000 contigs, which from short reads is actually reasonably good. Um, and with an N50 length, so 50% of the data was captured in 34 kilobase pair segments or larger. Um, so this was a, a really good genome, but importantly, they estimated that the size with unassembled repeats was a bit larger, somewhere around 64 megabase pairs. Now, um, when we think about why they had unassembled repeats and why they could not get included, we have to think about how we assemble data. Um, so there's several different assembly approaches. For short reads, we most typically use a graph approach and the most common is called a De Brown graph. Through this, um, and, and most people are familiar with sort of the sequencing metaphor where we take a book and we chop all the sentences of the book up into fragments of uniform length, but their fragments still the same, right? So we, we won't, we have to try to reassemble those words and figure out what they mean. And so <clears throat> up here I'm representing those short sequences um, as they come from the sequencer. And what we do is break them up into something called kamers. Now these kamers can just be thought of as words, right? We're breaking up uh, these sequences into words. And in this case of this example, I'm saying word length of five. And of course the kamer length will vary depending on the length of the sequencing read and the quality of the assembly. Um, but we can take these words and begin to identify how many of the same words that we've generated um, line up together versus how many unique words there are. And that's down here in the Kamer count. And so we get a distribution of Kamer counts. We can actually use that to estimate what our assembled genome size is going to be. But most importantly, we start to use these for our Brown graph construction. And uh, here, we're, I'm showing you how we have these unique kamers, and they start to align together. But when we start getting into kamers that have a higher count number, 
we start forming bubbles. And these bubbles get bigger and bigger until we can find algorithmic, other, algorithmically a path through those bubbles that gives us a reasonably good assembly. And when we do that, we call that resolving the bubbles. In some software, they call it popping bubbles. Um, but once we're able to resolve those, we can get our sequence. Well, repeats, as you can imagine, will have a very high count number in our Kamer distribution. And when we have a lot of repeats, we can't, we can't actually find a path through them. And so they get held in that bubble. And so I put over here, repeats are often held in unresolved bubbles. And so they never show up in our assembly. A strategy around that is to use long reads, reads that can actually span the repeat or most of the repeat in which we can use an overlap of process for assembly. So here we have the same sequences again, but instead of, of breaking them up into kamers, we're actually aligning them to each other and finding overlaps. And then we will stitch together the sequence based on those overlaps, generating a consensus call for the genome itself. Now, many of you have probably used sequencer or some of these other uh, approaches with aligning Sanger-based sequencing. It's the same basic principle, right? We're, we are aligning multiple sequence reads to find a consensus for the full length of the genome. In this way, we're much better at resolving repeats because our reads are long enough to actually span those repeats. However, for some repeats, so in humans, some of the repeats are tens of kilobases, right? And so nanopore sequencing provides a great platform for trying to resolve those repeats because we can get sometimes ultra long reads. Um, and so <clears throat> and the reason for that is the technology itself, right? So it is basically a pore that, that um, binds a, an enzyme that helps unwind the DNA molecule and um, a helicase, right? So it unwinds it and then it splits it into single strand. And that single strand is passed through the pore where uh, the bases have, or have hydrogens on them. Those hydrogens release a current as they pass through the pore and that's what's registered. And this tracing actually gives you a really good example of why we have a high error rate because you can see when you're passing through and you're reading the change in current, what we, what we get sometimes is some interference. And it's interference from the next base that's to come through, or it's, it's interference from <clears throat> an artifact in the system. But, um, and here's the sort of in real time process, right? So we're splitting uh, the double strand of DNA into a single strand, and then it's moving through the pore and is reading in real time this signal. Right, and, and so that signal sometimes has noise and sometimes creates error rates. Um, in the uh, early days of nanopore sequencing, those error rates were around 25%. Uh, now they're down around 15% on average. The great thing about it is it's small, right? It, so it has a high error rate, but here's a device it fits in the palm of your hand. It can plug into a laptop. You can take it to the field. You can do real-time sequencing with it. Um, the most uh, notable case of real-time sequencing with the MinION device was tracking the Ebola outbreak in, um, in Africa um, just a few years ago, right, where they were sequencing the virus in real time, whole genome sequencing, whole genome comparisons, and, and pinpointing some of the unique features of the genome that were were contributing to the spread of the disease. When we look inside this device, what we see is the sequencing flow cell, which is made up of all of these different pores. There are uh, 2,024 pores per flow cell, and they can move through the pore, a DNA molecule can move through the pore at about 250 bases per minute. So, uh, what we want to do is actually optimize all of these pores, right? And so <clears throat> on average, if we could occupy most of the pores most of the time, 
uh, I meant to also mention, these are living pores, right? These are not um, some sort of static pore that, that can last forever. So one of the important approaches here is that your, your flow cell has to be fresh when you're ready to sequence. You don't want to buy your flow cell a month ahead of time and keep it in the refrigerator. There will be some degradation and you'll get a loss of efficiency. Um, so we're interested in maximizing efficiency across all the pores on the flow cell. And we're interested in getting the best quality material into the flow cell as possible. And so our technical approach in this area was uh, to use a pure culture, extract high quality DNA, and avoid shearing as much as possible. Um, and so in my lab, one of the ways we avoid shearing is to actually pour instead of pipette. So we decant liquids instead of trying to pipette liquids. Or if we have to use a pipette, we actually cut the tip off so that the, the orifice that the material is going through is larger. We, again, we sequenced on the um, nanopore 1D genomic DNA by ligation, uh, flow cell 9.4. And then we assembled and polished, and then we evaluated our assembly quality using Busco. And I'm um, now gonna go into more details about that. So I mentioned you want, to, you want to occupy as much of your flow cell as you can. When, for those who haven't run one of these, when you do, you get an output. This is actually the summary output. You get an output in real time that uses the same color scheme. So here in light green are pores that are actively sequencing. Here uh, in dark green is a pore that is uh, getting occupied. And in blue is a pore that has sequenced and is recovering. In um, light blue is inactive. And what you really want is as little light blue as possible. Um, on the x-axis is the time scale, and on the y is the state time equivalent percent. That's really, you can think of that as the percent occupancy of the poor. And so you see, first of all, it, de it declines over time. Um, this is out to two days. And so we can get our maximum amount of sequencing done over two days, but you can actually you know, do a reasonable amount of sequencing within two to three hours, right? Here's the one hour, 30 minute mark. If all you were looking for were, uh, were amplicons, right? Particular se sections of sequence, that would be sufficient to get you plenty of data for detecting those sorts of things. So we ran it out for two hours. The expected yield on that data is about four to five gigabases um, per flow cell. Um, instead, what we got was two times that amount of coverage. So we got 10 gigs where we expected five. Um, no doubt due to having a, a really fresh flow cell, really high quality DNA um, worked out really well for us in this case, right? So, <clears throat> when we look at the data, we were also around 90% accuracy. So our error rate was around 10%. So we had lots of data, lots of pretty accurate data. The only disappointment was the mean read length, which was around 7 KB. I'd like to have had that higher, but what you can see from these dots is we had some reads that were up around 100 KB. Right, and these reads are the ones that are really important. These 60 to 100 KB, um, you know, where we can have repetitive regions that span 10, 12 KB, these reads can actually bridge those gaps for us, right? And we can, we can assemble those complicated regions as a result. So um, schematically, what does it actually look like? And what did we do? So we generate these long reads, and some programs, such as Canoe, um, will try to error correct these long reads. And error correction for really, really noisy reads like this takes a long time. When I assembled this genome using Canoe, it took about 32 days just to get my error correction on the reads. Instead, Minimap is a program written by Hang Lee, and um, what Minimap does is actually just map these reads to each other, right, to find overlaps. And that gives us these sorts of overlaps 
that are you know, what I call uncorrected pre-assembled reads and they're put together. So now we've gone from seven KV and sometimes longer into these overlaps where the average was closer to 30 KB. Well, that makes a big difference now in assembling to a contig. Um, Minia SM is another program written by Hangley where now we can take those uncorrected pre-assembled reads and start stitching them together into a contig. And this is done largely through overlap, but the way Hang Lee has written the program, it uses overlaps plus a graph assembly. So not only are we able to utilize the power of overlaps, we're able to utilize the algorithm behind graphs to find where there are complicated regions, we can start to resolve them. And what we end up with is a contig that has the exact same error rate as our raw reads, right? We have not corrected for error at all. But now we can take a combination of short and long reads and go back and polish this contig to correct all those errors, right? We can count on the efficiency, the, the precision 99.999% correctness of short reads to correct all of these sequencing errors in the contig itself. So, we went through this whole process. Um, this actually, you know, in, in contrast to taking 30 days to get our error read, cor our corrected reads to then begin to assemble, we were able to do this in uh, right around 72 hours of compute time. So a significant difference there. When we look at what we ended up with, we find, so here's the reference assembly again, 56 megs. Um, when we just assembled the nanopore contigs um, as raw sequences, what we find is uh, 94.3 megabase pairs, um, around 603 contigs. The 50% of our genome was contained in just 152 of those contigs. And the average length uh, for 50% was 194 KB. So this was great. Um, but it caused me a, a, sorry, let me go through the scaffolds first. So the nanopore scaffolds, um, you know, scaffolding is taking those contigs and then trying to stitch them together into even longer reads by going back to the raw reads and seeing if we can find reads that bridge gaps in the contig assembly. And so here, you know, it improved the numbers uh, slightly for total length, um, uh, fairly good for a number of contigs and fairly substantially for the amount of genome, 50% you know, of our genome was in 95 contigs. So that means that we, we really bumped up the average length of sequence, right? And here we're at 313 KB. And you contrast that with uh, 34, right? So we're close to 10 times the, the, that length. So, I was excited to get these results, but I was also really scared because I didn't know why it was so much bigger. And I thought, oh, I'm, I'm extending all these haplotypes. I'm not, the, the genome is not gonna be of, of really good quality. And so I rushed up to John McDowell's office and I said, you know, I'm getting a genome that's almost twice as big and this is kind of scaring me. And John just laughed at me and said, oh, everybody knows there are more repeats in there than we can acknowledge. <laughs> And so as a test, I uh, you know, went to the gold standard for a genomicist, which is confirming the genome size with flow cytometry. Um, and so here we developed a protocol to um, sort of more quickly be able to isolate nuclei, stain them, and uh, check the size. So here's uh, our uh, CAPCC sample. Here's Syningia speciosa which is another uh, genome that we recently assembled and done a lot of work with. So it was a good internal standard. This one's around 392 megabases. Um, and this estimate for CAPCC from flow cytometry was around 110 megabases. So I, I felt more confident um, that we were, what we were seeing was real and that this assembly was good. And in fact, I was, I was actually happier to have the estimated genome size a little larger than our assembly size, because I know from the data that we're still gonna miss repeats. We're still gonna collapse some things that we shouldn't. And so the, that fact gave me real confidence. And 
another way to assess our confidence in this genome is to look at something we call a BUSCO score. Um, BUSCO is an um, acronym. The basic idea behind it is that we are looking at conserved orthologs across a wide array of organisms. So these are genes that we have really high confidence in their, um, their sequence, in their position, in, in um, the level within the organism. So we can compare that uh, across multiple assemblies and, and get some idea of how good the assembly is. And so here's uh, what we were talking about earlier. So this is the reference assembly. 91% BUSCO score is a pretty good BUSCO score, right? Um, the Rhabdopsis thaliana, the model plant is around 94%. Tomato, another good reference genome is around 92%. So, you know, when we said this was a good assembly, it is a good assembly. It's 0% uh, duplication here. Of course, duplicates were held out, right? The repeats were held out from this assembly um, and that's um, by necessity. So if we just look at the raw long read assembly, what we see is that it's really bad, <laughs> right? I mean, strikingly bad. I was expecting 70%. I wasn't expecting 48.7% complete buscos um, and 50% missing, right? So <clears throat> that tells you what, e even at 10%, what the error rate does to the, to the quality of our assembly. But we can take um, our long reads and short reads and polish it. And I guess one of the reasons we, even though we're, we have noisy data in the long reads, one of the reasons we're, we really want to be sure that we use long reads and polishing is that the short reads still can't bridge the repeat gaps. The long reads can, and we have 100x coverage of the long reads. So we have really high confidence that we can correct. And when we do that, we see a, a significant improvement, but still not great, right? So we move up to around 62% total. Um, and now we're um, starting to get better um, single copy orthologs, some indication of duplication, but we're still missing a lot, right? So the bulk of the genome is still uncorrected. However, when we just use two rounds of short read polishing, we're now um, in, a, in a high quality zone, right? Now we have 97.49% complete bus codes. So we're really sure that these gene calls are accurate. And we're really sure that this duplication rate is fairly close to accurate. And now we're down to just 2.2% missing. So, we have high confidence that this genome is assembled well, the gene calls are fairly accurate, but it's important to remember at this point that any assembly really is just a hypothesis, right? So uh, I think John made a great point earlier when he said you know, the genome was the best it could be and still there's room for improvement. So this genome, this <laughs> one that we've done, is great, but there still may be room for improvement, and likely is. Now, genome assembly, just for genome assembly's sake, is pretty boring, at least to me. That, that's not, you know, I, I want to make, make genomes to do something with them. Um, and it just so happened we embarked on a, another collaboration with the McDowell Lab to actually look, use this genome to try to identify genes uh, that are differentially expressed when Phytophthora capsaicea is exposed to iron um, versus a, a depletion in iron. And so this experiment just had um, capsaicea on plates that John Hurley grew, um, uh, replete and deplete in iron. We, they used uh, single end RNA-seq to uh, generate the sequencing data. And then my lab took it and mapped it to the annotated draft genome and then conducted a DE-seq analysis. And you know, we have high confidence that, that our gene calls are correct, and therefore we have high confidence that what we see in this pattern um, is true. And of course, you know, this is a bioinformatician's dream, these data, right? Such clear separation between treatments. Um, I don't know, it's, it's like candy. So 
we're really excited and we're going to uh, follow this through and hopefully be done with this analysis soon. But it just shows that this genome is, is not only is it um, nice to update the genome for public use, but also for our own use. So in conclusion, um, we generated long reads from nan nanopore sequencing and it really, really helped to resolve this, this highly duplicated genome. Um, aside from the cost of the nanopore itself, which you know, depending on what package you get is somewhere between three and $5,000, we generated these long reads for just a $1,000 flow cell. Um, and then we developed a pipeline, um, just putting together existing software that could actually resolve uh, and assemble these noisy reads in about one sixth of the time of other, other um, programs. Uh, and with that, uh, we are happy to take any questions. This little uh, show me the data. Uh, when I teach uh, my genomic sequencing class, you know, I, I used to show this slide all the time because there was insufficient data to really prove that nanopore was useful. Uh, and now we know for sure that it is quite useful. Thank you. So I'll, I'll do the clapping. I'm sure there's, there's some going on in the audience. Um, that was really interesting, a lot of fun. I do not know much about genome sequencing, so that was a really interesting uh, talk for me. Um, so I see if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A. And I see we have a lot showing up. And um, Lee Jun Ma, who is my co-host, and I will take turns reading um, the questions. Do you want to start, Lee Jun? Absolutely. Read off the first. Absolutely. This is exciting. This is a question from Bangkok. And by, sorry, I probably let them spend, um, pronounce your name correctly. Ra Pong. Anyway, the question is, hi, I'm from Bangkok. Is it possible to count the number of chrom chromosomes, for example, by long reads? Yeah, so um, not by long reads alone, but there are several um, oh, sequencing strategies, I'll call them, to be able to uh, get the genome separated by chromosomes and then sequence it and then reassemble it um, based on chromosomes. Uh, one of those methods is called Hi-C. Um, some of you may have heard of Hi-C or BioNano. Um, so there are technical ways to do that. Yep. And just to follow up on that a little bit, do we know the number of chromosomes for this particular genome? I think the, the number of major chromosomes are, are known. I don't have that number off the top of my head. Uh, I think the question really gets interesting when you start considering um, many chroma chromosomes, supernumerary chromosomes, whatever. Li Jun, you above yeah. all others understand how interesting those are. They've not been explored at all in OMI seats. Let's work together. <laughs> <laughs> And that is one of the goals of these, which is to connect the community. Okay, so um, I'm going to read off our next question, which is by Liliana Cano, who thanks uh, Dr. Haik, and said, what strategies are you using to handle or improve the issue caused by heterozygosity in the PCAPCC genome? Yeah, so that's a fantastic question. Um, we... Uh, uh, skirted that issue by uh, using this particular um, strain or isolate. Um, however, one of the ways that we can do that, particularly with long reads um, and what we did in this assembly that I didn't talk about, it's sort of technical issue. I'm happy to talk about it um, at some point, but with long reads, we can actually phase and get haplotypes. So these long lines of haplotypes that can um, we can then start to resolve that heterozygosity. So um, initially in the assembly, we were around 130 megabases, but that was because of unresolved haplotypes. Once we resolved those, we actually dropped back down to around 95 megabases. So fa fantastic question. All right, next question. So it's from David Livingstone Nisbal. Using nanopore technology, at what point 
does the DNA split into single strain? And just a follow up to that question is, why not use the whole DNA double strained? Uh, great question. So um, the split happens right at the pore itself. The, the enzyme is actually bound to the outside edge of the pore and it's split as it goes in. The reason we want to use the, a, a haplotypic strand is just the, the, from the last question, right, heterozygosity. So we, we want to have a single side and sequence that and assemble that so that we're not um, trying to resolve differences between the strands in our assembly. That it makes the assembly much harder. Okay, so the next one is from Roger Innes who asks, for short read polishing, are you using Illumina to generate the short reads? Okay, hey Roger, hope you're doing well. Um, we did use Illumina to generate the short reads. However, the short reads were already generated. So one of the um, things I neglected to mention is we were trying to, to, in trying to find a system uh, to sequence. We were trying to see what bump we could do. And so in this particular, um, for CAPCC, but also for the particular ISA LT263, some data already existed. Right. And so there was plenty of short read data that we could use to polish these long reads. And so we didn't have to generate that de novo. Mm -hmm. So next question from Sierra Pong Krajan He. You probably didn't spell, pronounce your name correct. I'm sorry. And this question actually from Bangkok. And the question is, what was the read boost score core gene set used to evaluate the assembly quality? Um, it was in the uh, straminophile. I'll have to go back and look specifically. I, I don't remember. Um, we tested between two different uh, existing databases, um, but both of them were relevant. Okay, our next question is from Sian or Sean Deller. Why did you use this, choose this strain of PCAPCC? And um, they're writing from Syngenta in the UK. Great, yeah, so <clears throat> as I mentioned, you know, we, we, in going and looking for an organism, um, I wanted something that was, um, of course, relevant, but also where the, a, no, a bit of work had been done. Um, and when I approached John about it, he was like, if I got the thing for you. So, um, you know, it, it was well studied. There were existing genomic resources that we could try to leverage to, to um, sort of thinking about the typical lab, right? A typical lab has been working with a particular strain for some time. They may have a bit of MySeq data or other Illumina data laying around. Uh, and if, if they could just add some long read sequencing to that, they could gain more information. And that really was our, our goal here. I'll add to that a little bit. The, um, the reason that we use this particular strain is that it's um, highly virulent on Arabidopsis. Mm -hmm. Not all Phytophthora capsizi strains have that attribute, but, um, but thanks to Francine Gover's work, we, um, we knew that LT263 grew very, um, very happily on Arabidopsis. So that's our lab reference strain. And, um, and as David mentioned, we had already committed to, um, to do a, doing a lot of RNA-seq with this particular strain. So we knew that that resource would be available to, um, to apply to the uh, new version of the genome for more accurate annotation. Great. So next question from Michael Said, Said, and hey, thanks for the clear talk. I have a question on the Brusco duplicates. Assume that you succeeded in an hyploid genome assembly. Do you think 20% is a real duplication? Maybe indicative for aneuploidy. Or do you think that some hypotypes are not flattened and represented in your assembly? Thanks, Michael. Uh, I think yes to all of the above. <laughs> so so 
when we, uh, in the paper, we dive into a little bit of evolutionary analysis. So when we look across the clade, what we find, especially from uh, some of the long read um, assemblies coming out of Brett Tyler's lab, that, that we find uh, that is relatively consistent, right? 15 to 20% duplication is not abnormal for the clade in which this um, particular Phytophthora sits. So I believe that we're right in, in you know, somewhere north of 15%. Is it 20%? Are we collapsing some? I'm sure. I'm sure that we're collapsing, collapsing some haplotypes, but um, no, we just need more data. Yeah, I think I follow up because this yeah. is a intriguing couple of um, questions to connect with that. Mm -hmm. I thought one simple technology maybe you can use is looking for the sequence coverage across the whole genome. If a Michael's hypothesis is true, you should see split of bimodal distribution of your coverage. If it's not, then you should more uniform distribution. That's right. Of course, yeah. for repetitive genome, it, you're going to see a bump somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But if you have two major hypotypes split, that could be indicated. I was just thought about that. That's right. And so, and so what we, um, when we assembled the genome, we actually uh, went through and looked up uh, at coverage across all of them, and then basically did a coverage correction for haplotypes where we thought um, we were actually collapsing. And this next question is really, people are very interested in this. So the next one is by Andrew. I'm not sure if it's Gitto or Gitto. Andrew asks, can heterozygous alleles be kept in the assembly? So a lot uh, of interest there. Yeah, yes, as long as you have enough Illumina data. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, so as long as you can be sure that that call is, is in fact correct, you can. So follow up that question. It just, I think it's a very interesting question. So we also worked a little bit on my OMIC mm -hmm. and we are starting work on the RNA-seq data, um, John. So the haplotype really play a role there because we noticed that effector genes have capture higher diversity and that expression of the two haplotypes does not express equally. So mm -hmm. get understand of two different alleles may be important. I don't know. We just started that. So that's why I guess caught a lot of fascination here. Um, but okay, I read for the next question. It's from Valerie Williams Williamson. So what did you learn about repeat sequence and distribution from the new assembly? Yes, so the um, in terms of of looking, delving into the repeats to see what's there. Uh, that's currently being done um, a, as a project in my lab. Um, it, just sort of from a um, overall perspective, looking at, at uh, KS plots, trying to estimate you know, something about repeats and repeat evolution within this group. You know, what we found actually is there's, there's you know, there was already circulating evidence to support a duplication leading to this lineage. And we found further evidence uh, supporting that notion um, that, that was originally, uh, again, put forth. Um, so um, the repeats uh, in some cases are very old. And um, in other mm -hmm. cases, you know, we're, we're actively investigating to see what sort of effectors are, are in some of these um, newly resolved repeats. Interesting. Um, so Yu, Yu Feng Fan uh, writes, hi, to follow up, what was the coverage of the nanopore reads? Um, I don't know if you want to answer that quickly, and then I'll read the yeah. other half question. Yeah, so our coverage was about 100x. Okay. And have you checked chromosomal elements, including telomeres and centromeres? Nope. I happen to know Yu Feng's an expert in this area, so um, go for it, buddy. Yeah, that sounds great. Can, can I follow on that? Because uh, when you talk about your algorithms through the your introduction and the minimap too developed, it's very intriguing. I think it's a very clever um, process. 
but uh, that's, I wonder, did you test it with a minimal coverage requirement? 100x, it's a lot for the new sequencing. And I guess you said you're very lucky you have more than you anticipated to get into it. I just wonder from, in order to make that algorithm effective, it's a minimal coverage requirement. Uh, is there a minimal coverage requirement? Yes. Um, uh, Dr. Lee suggests that with Nanopore, you have no less than 30x. I see. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So here's the next question from Ash Wabi. Oh, maybe. Oh. Anyway, the question is, what about the reliability of using Nanopore sequence in sequencing the genome of a tetraploid? which exactly has the four sets of chromosomes? Yeah, I'll let you know in a couple of months. Um, we're, we're working on a frog right now. <laughs> it's a hexaploid. Um, it, and uh, the, the short answer is coverage, right? The more coverage you can get, the better you can start to resolve these things. Um, but I think it will also entail um, some other techniques such as bio nano where we can actually try to pull down um, either telomeres or centromeres and, and try to really pinpoint chromosomes. Um, so Liliana Cano has another question. Thanks, Dr. Haik. Would you say nanopore sequencing could also be used to study sequence uh, a collection of PCAPCC isolates as well? Maybe in <clears throat> Maybe in that way, nanopore data can improve traditional DNA seq Illumina data or make it cheaper. Yeah, so I would actually suggest the opposite. I, I would suggest that you use nanopore to generate your reference. If you have, if you're looking, you know, for for how things compare to a particular reference, use nanopore to generate the the draft sequence that you want to use for that reference. And then you use Illumina to get all your population data where you can be sure that all the allele calls are in fact correct. And incidentally, still, uh, that would be cheaper, right? Illumina is still per base is much cheaper than Nanopore. So next question from Juan Carlos Diaz. How many times when can you use a Nanopore matrix? So, uh, that depends on how much sequencing you do. So if you do like what, what we did, which is use it for two days, 48 hours, it's done. I if see. you use it for two hours, you can wash it and there will still be some viable pores on it. So the number of pores it uses is a function of time. And, and so that's, that's the um, rule there. And it, in, that, in our experience, that was very true. So it's just to follow up on that. Is a washing technique matters? Um, it, you, you do two hours and then you're washing. And then the second round, uh, I, I was just trying to see from um, economic perspective, do you suggest to say, yeah, do two hours, wash it, use it a couple of times. Or, no, do the two days and get the maximum you can. I think it depends on your goal. Mm -hmm. So I was helping another lab that was trying to see if they could um, wash off a leaf surface and sequence that and just um, like micro, microbiome sequencing, just capture a particular gene and count to see what the abundance was there. Doing that, washing after two hours, that was actually pretty effective. They got four runs out of a single flow cell. Makes sense. Interesting. So our next one is, and uh, we don't have a name up there, but somebody from India. Who, and I just want to point out, we have had people from all over the world. And just to do a side trip into the chat, we've had Thailand, India, <clears throat> Bangladesh, and I know I'm missing some of the other ones. Um, but yeah, oh, Nigeria. So people from all over, it was terrific. So, um, this person asks, what strategy can be followed to sequence tetraploid, tetraploid plant species using nanopore sequencing technology? Yeah, so um, we have a project, a collaborative project, where we're sequencing a uh, uh, tetraploid plant that's got a 10 gig genome. Um, and, and for that, 
we elected to use PEC Bio rather than Nanopore, so a combination of PEC Bio and Illumina. And the reason we picked PEC Bio is because Nanopore is somewhat temperamental, right? especially with large plant genomes. So uh, I say we got lucky and got twice the coverage we expected from Nanopore. And that's, that's really it. So, um, uh, Lee John uh, already alluded to the fact that with Nanopore, um, you really want to have the best hands in your lab preparing the DNA, loading the flow cell, taking care of the flow cell. All those things add up to affect your coverage. And one day you can get uh, twice as much as you expected. The next day you might get half as much as you expected. Um, we, we tried to sequence a complicated parasitic plant genome on the nanopore and the DNA quality numbers were just a little bit off and it resulted in really low quality data. So um, it, it's really important to, for, for nanopore to have all those steps in a row. Now, do I think that you can do it? Yeah, I think you know, people with molecular biology experience can go in and, and set up their flow cell and, and run things without problem. And, and if you do, you know, if you do run into a problem, you can always get another flow cell and get a, a bit more data. Um, but for a large sequencing project where you know that you're already going to be spending thirty, forty thousand dollars on long reads, um, Pack Bio still gets you more bang for your buck in terms of the error rate. Right. So next question from a friend, and uh, I, I think maybe this is better answered by Jean yourself, and. Uh, the person's really interested to get free materials to understand sequencing molecular plant pathology? That's a terrific question. <laughs> and I can only give a little bit of the answer, but I'm hoping other people will jump in. Um, so uh, there's a lot of information uh, available on the internet, that, which is a great place to start. Certainly, this entire seminar series is free. So I encourage you to go back and listen to some of the ones that you might have missed and to tune in for the future ones, um, which are all going to be, um, I can't promise they'll all be on pathology, some might be on symbiosis, but they will all be on plant, molecular plant microbe interactions. Um, we also have, remember, all of our technical advances are currently open access um, and all of our resource announcements. And we are, as of January, the whole journal will be um, completely open access. You'll be able to access anything um, going back and also going forward. And that would be, that's a, a great place. Um, John, do you have anything to add? Any suggestions? Uh, I was going to point out that um, a lot of the um, legacy review articles in MPMI, as well as upcoming review articles, will be um, either are or will be open access. And collectively, there's some great resources there in. And uh, as a new editor for the jour journal, I will also tell the audience that if you particular subject you wanted to learn, which you don't find available yet, you can write suggestion to the journal to see whether we can help you to mm -hmm. find additional, at least we can point it to the right direction. Very good suggestion. Um, and that actually reminds me that one month from today, we're going to have, or whatever, not, not our next seminar, but our seminar after that. So four weeks from now, um, we're going to be having um, um, Brandon Reagan from Tessa Birch Smith's lab is going to be talking about a really uh, nice review that they wrote on um, plasma desmata and plant virus interactions that came out in our January focus issue on um, the cell biology of plant virus and, and virus vector interactions. And that's gonna be, we're opening that up completely open access as well. So that could be a great way to get some good background about the cell biology of, of those interactions. Okay, let's move on to the next one. We have Shruti um, Barathan who is asking, what are the shortcomings of using nanopore sequencing? Yeah, so I highlighted some of them, right? That the input material is really critical. The quality scores, you know, uh, many of you who are used to sending things off for sequencing, you know, if your quality score is a 1.7, it doesn't really matter for Illumina, um, it, you know, uh, for the uh, 280, 260. If, for nanopore, it really matters. The closer to two you can get them, the better off you're going to be. 
The second big drawback is just the amount of material, right? We're, we're talking about needing micrograms of DNA starting material as opposed to nanograms. So the starting material is another big one. And then again, care and handling of your flow cells is critical. Can't, you know, when they come in, they've got to go right into the refrigerator. Um, they can't sit on the bench for a while. So, it, you know, all, all things that we're used to with enzymes and other things, but still, you know, it's sequencing. So sometimes that's a, a barrier to get over. So the next question from Ninofa Mirza from India. How to go about genomes where we have no knowledge about genome size or the number of chromosomes? Yeah, so I, um, the number of chromosomes is, it can be important, but the genome size is critical, right? In estimating what coverage you need and all of that. And I really feel like the, the best way to go about that is, is using flow cytometry to estimate what your genome size is there. You need a protocol for doing it. Um, my lab is working on a protocol for oomycetes in, in general, and I'm happy to share that with anybody who, who wants it. Um, but the, the key is having a protocol to be able to isolate nuclei and stain them and some sort of control sample. And knowing something about your organism um, from the literature about its general size. If it's going to be a hundred megabases, then you need something that's larger than that, right? So you always want to go, your, your internal standard should always be larger than what you expect your sample to be. Interesting. Um, so our next um, question is by Liliana Cano. Liliana, I'm going to hold off on your question for right now. You've had a couple of really good questions. Let's see. Um, I want to get to some people who have not asked the question yet. So our next one is, um, do you want to read the next one, Lee Jun? Sure. Uh, this one probably, we, I think we talked, but let's touch on that. This one from Cao Hui Liu. And the question is, can you please talk about the pros and the cons for nanopore and the PEC bio? Thanks. Yeah, so <clears throat> pros and cons, you know, we can start with cost. Like the initial cost for PEC bio is higher um, because on the SQL system, you can't just buy one small unit, right? You have to buy either a full smart cell or a cluster of smart cells. So right there, you're, you're, your job has to be big enough to justify five to eight thousand mm -hmm. um, dollars. Whereas with the nanopore, you can buy an individual flow cell, you can buy two flow cells, you can have the same unit set up uh, for doing uh, long read RNA seq data or genomic data, right? So it's really flexible in, in that capacity. Um, cons of, of nanopore versus PacBio is, is the error rate. Right. The error rate for PacBio is somewhere around uh, 3% now, so it's much better still than, than what Nanopore is. Um, the cost per base is lower with PacBio, but after you get over that initial investment. So um, both of them can give you long reads. Um, the longest reads right now are coming from Nanopore. Right, where, where you can do all the customization. So, um, you know, recent, uh, recently someone did a full chromosome arm of yeast, so. Great. Interesting. So our next one is by Gautam Shusikar. Have you annotated this genome? And if so, could you briefly explain the strategy? That might be a whole nother talk, David. I don't know. Yeah, yeah I, I can briefly do it. We did annotate it. The annotation is available with the genome. Um, uh, you just follow the link from the paper. Uh, the strategy was we used Maker to do so. The strategy was to first um, do uh, uh, um, machine learning based de novo identification of gene regions and then go back with um, the, the Lamore lab did a beautiful job over the years of annotating and updating the annotation for the genome they published. So we used their data heavily to identify the true genes um, from the predicted genes in this genome. And then, uh, as John mentioned, we also had in-house some um, RNA-seq data from this exact um, strain that we were able to also use to, to verify uh, 
the, the predicted genes. Just to follow up on that question, how many total number of genes is the genome have you annotated? Uh, I don't remember. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, should, I should look it up. Oh, that's okay. Um, so I can read the next question. It, it was almost identical to um, what the Lamore lab had identified. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a, uh, just a handful more. So next question from Junyang Ying. What strategy is used to arrange nanopore contact to scaffold? So it's basically the scaffold strategy. Yeah, so, so it's um, the program that we used is called S-Space Long Reads. Um, and essentially what it does is, is take any given information, any information you can give it via the raw reads or um, other Illumina data, and between when, as uh, someone already alluded to in their questions, when we have contigs that get stuck together, what happens is all the gap space gets filled with ends. And what it does is goes and tries to overlap reads across those ends and fill in that information. And of course, you set the threshold of how many reads it's going to take and how big a gap it will fill to try to stitch those together into, into scaffolds. So our next one is Nilofar Mirza. I'm talking about fungal genome. Want to ask about heterogeneous genomes more, if you can elaborate a little. Um, so the, the real problem with um, really heterogeneous genomes. So uh, um, as Lee Jun mentioned earlier, the, uh, we had a project where we were um, sequencing downy mildew, right? And when we align our, and, and go and count our contigs and, and look for overlaps, we see two very distinct, very large bimodal peaks, which indicates a, a high degree of heterozygosity, more heterozygosity than humans, right? And so that's coming from other bits, right? There, there's more than just the nuclear genome there when, when we see that much differentiation. There's no, great resolution for that, except for you know, getting a lot of Illumina data and more high quality long read data. Next question from Francine Covers, and this is related with your RNA-seq um, experiments. Thanks for the nice talk. What is the concentration of the iron you used? Do you see any phenotype upon treatment and what is your thought about the biological relevance of ion in the interaction? You're muted, John. The data that um, David showed was from comparison of P. Easy grown on iron replete versus um, iron depleted synthetic medium. And I don't recall the, um, the concentration of iron in the um, in the iron depleted medium, but it was quite low. Um, I think on the order of 10 micromolar or so. Now, in terms of effects, um, the, um, when we grow PCAPCZ either on iron depleted synthetic medium or iron depleted Arabidopsis plants, growth is reduced, but, um, but not as much as you might expect, you know, on the order of let's say 25 or 30%. So I take that as evidence that Phytophthora capsizi is very good at scavenging iron from its environment. And one of the things that we hope to learn from the comparison that, um, that David was showing in the slide are the um, mechanisms through which it, um, it does that. And one of the nice things that, um, that Davis, David's analysis has uncovered is a, um, a putative iron scavenging regulon, which mm -hmm. indicates that um, the PCAPCZ has a mechanism for, um, for active transport of reduced iron from, um, from the extracellular environment. That may not mean, mean much to you if you're not an iron nerd, but, um, but it's, it possibly contrasts with other plant-associated microbes who, um, who rely predominantly on um, secretion and then uptake of um, siderophores as their mechanism for, um, for collecting iron. So there's a lot more on that to come. 
In terms of its overall relevance, you know, obviously Phytophthora, like every other organism, needs iron to survive. And so, uh, you know, as I said, we're interested in the dynamic between the, um, the plant and the pathogen in terms of fighting for this iron. And I think the question's particularly interesting for on the plant side because, as you know, plants require um, iron as a critically important factor in the immune response for um, generation of an oxidative burst. So it, is, is it indeed actively trying to withhold iron at the infection site? And if so, is there a trade-off for immune efficiency? And what are the underlying mechanisms through, all, through which all of this occurs? Interesting. Um, so that was interesting to get into that bit of iron biology. Um, so, oh, and just before I read the next question, I want to point out that um, we have posted in the chat a link to the actual paper. So it doesn't have the iron um, part in it, I think, but it, but that's, that's new stuff that you got added just because you came to the seminar. But, um, but you can follow that link to get uh, lots of the details from the methods, et cetera. And if you return to the site where you registered for this talk, you'll be able to um, listen to the recording once we post it, which will hopefully be in the next day or two. Okay, Howlin Yu uh, uh, says, thank you for the very informative talk. Comparing with the non-repetitive genome part, what other distinct genomic features besides repetitive are for those repetitive sequences that are assembly? Yeah, are so it's a, it's a great question. Um, the, Again, I have a collaborator whose uh, expertise is in uh, repetitive gene family evolution, and um, hopefully he's working on that analysis as we speak. So I really don't we don't know yet is the is the honest answer. Um, I suspect that we're going to find that there are some uh, repetitive housekeeping type genes in there, um, uh, and certainly some. Uh, effectors are going to be found in this enriched repeat region. Yeah, for those of you who aren't familiar with um, OMICETE genome organization, effector genes tend to um, congregate in regions of the genome that are um, re repeat rich, you know, and that's that mode of organization is thought to facilitate rapid evolution with the, um, with the host. So what I would expect are that there, um, there are quite a few interesting and heretofore um, unidentified RXR, RXLR effectors and other types of effectors within this, um, this new fraction of the genome. Right. So next question from Junian Ying. Does a polishing process decrease SNPs? Uh, that's a great question because it, it can. And so you have to be really careful how you go about uh, polishing. So we were fortunate that the reads that were available, the short reads that were available, were from uh, this isolate um, and in large part represented this isolate very well. If you uh, take your reference assembly that you're making and you use reads from something else to polish it, yes, you will polish away polymorphisms that might be important if you're looking to do population genomics. So I would not, I would, um, advise against doing that. Um, in, in our case, the reads that were available, of course, because we chose this organism um, in, in this particular strain, were from the same organism. So uh, if you, uh, I saw that there was another question that I could go ahead and answer, you know, so could you use this approach for a new organism? And I wouldn't, right? I, for a new organism, I would try to figure out how big the genome size is, and then I would use a combination of long reads and short reads to try to build my own reference for that organism. Okay, I'm going to jump down to the bottom because that's been put out of order because of time zone. Um, uh, Alfredo Reyes Tena says, from Mexico, how much does the Minayan cost? Ah, oh, yeah, so the, the device itself, um, it, I think if you pay $3,000, you get the device and a single flow cell. 
if you buy the starter kit, I think it's like $5,000 and you get the device, you get reagents, you get two flow cells of your choice. Um, um, once you've paid for that, then you just buy the flow cells afterward. Um, and the flow cells are regenerated by Oxford Nanopore. So you get the flow cell, you use it, you wash it and you ship it back, but then you buy another one. So next question is from BR3. I think it's, again, it's a strategy. Maybe you already touched, but I'll read just anyway. Thanks, John and David. Um, so you re rely heavily on the short reads database in polishing. Does that mean this method is not suitable for assembling a new genome? So I think you touched. If you want to skip, that's okay. Yeah. I think that that was covered in the last mm -hmm. question. Um, Karina Achistan, when you map the RNA-seq reads to the new genome, are you improving the percentage of mapped reads yes. with respect to the reference genome? And at genome prediction level, did you improve this parameter? Yes, to both questions. So we saw a dramatic increase um, with the proportion of RNA-seq reads that mapped. We went from around 80% to 94%. Uh, reads mapping, which is a, a nice big change. So next question from Juanita Gill. What was the coverage of the Illumina reads used for polishing where you rounded a minimal coverage to polish or draft the genome from nanopore reads? Yeah, so the minimum recommended coverage is somewhere around 60x. Um, we had available to us somewhere around 200x. Um, and, oops, sorry, it moved. Um, someone, we don't have a name for this one. How efficient will nanopore sequencing be in the case of metagenome study, especially rhizosphere microbiome? And I know you're trying this with microbiome stuff as well. Yeah, yeah that's right. So in our hands, uh, for metagenomes, it is, it is fantastic um, because we, we can multiplex up to 12 samples, we can get really good coverage and long reads. You know, 7 KB for a metagenome read is, is great, right? That means we've captured most 90% of the possible full-length genes in the sample. Um, and so I, I think it's going to be good. And soon I'll have some data to compare PacBio and Nanopore. Interesting. Next question from Marcelo. And actually the question basically is, can you use the same strategy to pee in festons? Have you thought about it? Um, yes, it, it could be done. And, and to my knowledge, it is being done. So, but not by me. And Liliana Cano has another question. Would you say that the DNA input to be used for nanopore sequencing should have high molecular weight, same as required for PacBio sequencing? And would you recommend greater than 20 KB? So these are some specific questions. And also DNA extraction kit of preference. Sounds like people are out there pretty interested in trying your approach, uh, John and yeah. David. Good. Yeah. Um, and and I, uh, just to, to tack on to something you said earlier, Jean, you know, um, the fantastic thing about having the article open source is the link to some of these resources for some of these questions is available within the article, right? So you can, we've posted our protocol, we've posted mm -hmm. all the ancillary data um, there. And so um, in, in this open source world, uh, I hope that people can, can use those resources. I would say that the amount required is more than for PacBio and the higher molecular weight you can get, the better. Right. And, and um, greater than 20 KB. So we ran a gel. We picked only the stuff that came at the top of the gel, which was closer to 40, 50 KB. Right. So there's not a ladder. You just got to go. You get your 20 KB ladder and you run everything out. Everything that's above that ladder you take. <laughs> so I want to just jump in here and say that one reason that MPMI has made all the technical advances open access is because we really want you guys to try this. So we would like you to take advantage of this knowledge and see um, what you can do um, with your own projects. Okay, next question. Ah, Juan Carlos uh, Diaz Ricci says, wonderful news and many thanks. You wanna go to the next one, Li Jun? Oh, sure. So next friends, um, which 
didn't put the name, but a very interesting bring back to the biology. We did the genome sequence. What are the next steps um, that would help us to elucidate why does the pathogen species have such a broad host range? Could this be related to the duplication of the genome? So I, I can speak to that one for a minute. I, th I think it's important to make the distinction that all of the strains within the species collectively have a broad host range, but individual strains of PCAP CZ likely are more narrow. Now, with that said, the, you know, these strains are in many cases likely to colonize multiple hosts. So, for example, the strain that we use for Arabidopsis, I think, was obtained from a um, a cantaloupe in East Tennessee or a watermelon or something like that. So to speak to your question, um, that, you know, that, that's one of the big questions in the NPMI field. Why, you know, why is it that some pathogens have a broad host range and others are, um, are restricted? I would, um, you know, as an effector biologist, my natural tendency is to explain everything in terms of effectors, right? As either um, promoting or restricting colonization on a particular host, but that's undoubtedly a simplistic answer. And I think probably the answer depends on the nature of the pathogen in question and the host that it either inhabits or doesn't. Sorry for that non-answer, but <laughs> ask it again in 10 or 20 years. So our, our next question is from Sora S. Can we conclude that for large size genomes, we need to consider multiple platforms to get a complete sequence? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the next question from Nilo Far Maraza. How much processing capacity was required for this assembly? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Um, what I assembled this, or Jin Ming assembled this, um, on our small cluster, which is uh, just 96, pro so it's 48 processors, dual core, so 96 cores. Um, we had available one terabyte of RAM. It only used about uh, 150 gigs of RAM. So it's, it's not, you know, many people have gaming computers that are, uh, that are more resource intensive than what we used. So the next one is uh, also, we have no name, uh, it says, thanks for a nice talk. And I think this is directed more towards John. Does the pathogen produce biofilm? In some bacterial plant pathogens, some biofilm related regulators seem to also influence iron scavenging. Uh, could that be the case in P. Capsic? Ah, but you know, that's a really thought provoking um, series of questions. The, um, what we know about PCAP CZ, and I think this is true for phytophthora or root pathogens in general, is that they, um, they tend to prefer penetration in the zone of elongation, okay? So they, they congregate in that region of the root rather than being distributed across the entire root length. We, we see this really clearly with our pathosystem because we grow it in a hydroponic system, so it's easy to see where the um, preferential sites of attachment are. Now, what's really cool about your question is that it caused me to recall a talk that I saw at an OMICET meeting last summer where, um, where there was evidence presented that this, you know, this congregation, if you will, has biofilm-like qualities. So I'm going to think about that some more. And, you know, for sure, there have been hints in the OMICET area of... Um, evidence for quorum sensing in the past, but no really coherent picture has emerged yet. And I think the, these are really cool things to think about. Thanks for um, bringing that up. I'm gonna jump in, because that, that's sort of, that's interesting to me, because right here we have, you know, we're thinking about Phytophthora is obviously a pathogen, but really this is an issue, this whole idea of trying to get iron is a key issue for plants, for microbes that are interacting with plants. And so, Recently, in the rhizobium legume literature, there's been a lot of excitement because people have identified three different iron transporters that appear to be used um, in the infected cells 
probably to deliver iron to the, the vesicles that contain the bacteria. So um, this whole, you know, obtaining it from the environment and when your environment is the plant, how do you obtain it? So it's a really interesting and extremely important question. Yeah, okay. that's a big reason why I'm drawn to iron in particular, yeah. is the implications for all of the other plant-associated microbes. Yes, it's generally very relevant. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to read this, this second to last, and then I think we're down to the last question, Lee Jun. So, Dev Duta Deb says, thank you, David and John, for the talk. How centenic is the current PCC assembly with other known Phytophthora species? And I think you have a very beautiful figure in your paper, actually. Um, yeah. Yeah. So there's there's strong synteny between um, all the members in this clade. You know, there's obviously some uh, repositioning, some rearrangement, but but very little evidence that there are lots of of gaps, lots of of new genes um, within uh, these within this clade. All right. So we come to the last question. So it's technique. It's related with the sequence coverage. Uh, so I just read straight out from Ethan Fun and a good question, David. Generally, do you think long, long, long rates definitely produce better genome assembly? You said you got 100x coverage by just using one single whole cell. Do you think you get sufficient long rates? Uh, in other words, do you expect the more long rates could result in lower sequence coverage? Yeah, so... Um, it's an interesting question. What I what I first say is that the coverage is more to do with our error rate than the read link. I, I do wish that we had gotten an average read length closer to 20 KB. So in some pure pack bio stuff that I've done, I've gotten uh, you know around 17 KB, and I had hoped for something like that with this nanopore data, because um, I think that would help resolve more repeats and get us a more accurate genome. But in terms of coverage, I think with nanopore, you cannot sacrifice the coverage because of the high error rate. Well, thanks everyone. I'm going to um, jump in here. We have answered, um, oh, Perfect final question. The final question from Mila Farmers. I thank you for this talk and for the lecture series. I would really like to follow the series. Where can I follow that? And um, I, Ashley, is it possible for you to, to paste in the link to our web page? Hopefully we can get that and um, paste it into the chat. Um, and so, um, but you can always go to, oh, and here she has done it look at the chat and she has the link to our virtual seminar series. And if you go there, what you'll notice is that our next talk is gonna be a, in two weeks. We're alternating time zones. If it's the wrong time for you, you can always come back to the same page and find the recordings. But I wanted to thank everybody for joining today. We had a really terrific um, audience. Thanks to um, David and John for a really interesting presentation and a lot of stamina, especially for David, with the, with the questions. I, I want you guys to notice that he answered questions for twice as long as he actually gave his seminar. So, um, so what that means is that we really got to interact and, and uh, connect with a lot of you around the world. That was a lot of fun, a lot of good ideas. I can tell from the questions that many of you are thinking of trying this yourself. And I think that David and John would encourage you to do this because this was, of course, why they wrote their technical advance. Um, so please go take a look at the, at the paper. It's um, open access and it has all the details, the DNA kit, everything you want to know to repeat this. So I hope you'll share the news about this um, series and that you'll join us in two weeks for the seminar um, by Hong Lu from Feng Sui's lab, um, talking about this tritrophic interaction virus, aphid plant, how a symbiotic virus helps out its aphid host and not the plant. Um, anyway, David and, and John, do you want to have any, any last words here before we, we close the session? I'd just like to thank the audience for some terrific questions and um, encourage you guys to reach out if questions occur to you after we sign off today. Just hit us up. Yeah.
Absolutely. I'll just echo that. Um, I really enjoyed the questions. So that yeah. was fantastic. Yeah, you guys did a terrific job. Okay, thanks everyone. Goodbye. And I hope we'll see you in two weeks.